This is lecture four in this course on antibiotics. The topic is antibiotics for gram-positive infections. The learning objectives are first to know the general spectrum of activity for antibiotics active against gram-positive organisms. Second, to be able to compare the spectrum of activity and major side effects of the antibiotics used for highly resistant gram-positive infections, that is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus or MRSA, and vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, or VRE. And third, to be able to select an appropriate antibiotic for infections with gram-positive organisms. As with some of the other lectures in this course, there will be several charts. Please do not try to memorize every detail of these. It's the general overview that is more important than each individual plus and minus sign. Also consistent with the common convention introduced in lecture one, when I discuss gram-positive infections, I am specifically referring to aerobic gram-positive organisms. Anaerobic infections and relevant antibiotics will be discussed in lecture six. So here's the first of these charts. This is an antibiotic susceptibility table for routine gram-positive infections, which are listed on the left. Methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, coagulase negative staph, group A and B streptococcus, strep pneumoniae, which you may recall is also known as pneumococcus, Viridin's group strep, Enterococcus vicalis and fecium, and lastly, Listeria. These are by no means the only gram-positive infections out there, but aside from MRSA and VRE, which I'll talk about in a minute, these are otherwise the most commonly encountered ones in routine clinical practice. The part one of this chart will focus on the penicillins and cephalosporins. So first up are the natural penicillins, most commonly penicillin G. The natural penicillins have no reliable staph coverage, but are great for most forms of strep. Although they have uh, usually have some activity against Enterococcus faecalis and Listeria, they are not the preferred agents for these infections. Instead, the amino penicillins, consisting of amoxicillin and ampicillin, are the agents of choice for penicillin-sensitive Enterococcus faecalis and Listeria, and also provide coverage of group A and B strep and strep pneumoniae. When an amino penicillin is combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor to create either augmentin or unison, good MSSA coverage is now added. The anti-staph penicillins, nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin are next, and as you might have guessed, have excellent MSSA coverage and fair coag-negative staph coverage. Although there is some strep coverage, one would not use an anti-staph penicillin for an infection known to be caused by streptococcal species, as there are better beta-lactam options for that. The combination of an anti-pseudomonal penicillin and beta-lactamase inhibitor, as seen with Zosin, uh, provides broad gram-positive coverage of just about everything except viridin strep. Cephalosporins vary substantially in their gram-negative and anaerobic coverage, but for the most part, their gram-positive coverage is fairly similar, with only a few minor differences between individual drugs. Cephalosporins tend to have excellent MSSA and strep coverage, including viridin strep, but have less reliable coverage of coag-negative staph and have absolutely no coverage of enterococcus or listeria. Let's take a closer look at part two of this chart. The carbapenems, which are very broad-acting, cover all gram-positives well, with the exception of Enterococcus fecium. Also, as you can see, ertapenem, which is in this and some other ways ever so slightly less broad than the other members of this class, does not cover Enterococcus faecalis either. The quinolones, specifically levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, provide great Enterococcus faecalis, strep A, B, pneumoniae coverage, and fair staph and listeria coverage. Ciprofloxacin is not listed because, as a general rule, it has inadequate gram-positive coverage to be considered a reasonable option for most gram-positive infections. Gram-positive coverage for the macrolides, most commonly azithromycin, but also clarithromycin, is fair with better coverage of strep pneumoniae and group A and B than anything else. Tetracyclines, which in the United States essentially means just doxycycline, has excellent strep pneumo coverage but as with the macrolides, otherwise has less robust gram-positive coverage. Trimethoprim, sulfomethoxazole, 
which goes by many other names, most common of which is Bactrim in the U.S., and Cotrimoxazole in many other parts of the world, has great gram-positive coverage with the exception of Enterococcus and Coag-negative staph. Finally, clindamycin covers MSSA a bit, as well as group A and B strep, and strep pneumoniae. So that was a lot of information. Um, is there any way to distill this down into something more digestible and possibly even memorizable? Here's a list of preferred antibiotics for specific serious gram-positive infections. Keep in mind this list is very general. You always want to consider whether the chosen antibiotic will get to the organ in question, as well as consider your hospital and community's local resistance patterns. Instead of reading through the whole list, for those interested, I recommend pausing the video here and taking your time with it. That's because we can simplify things even further. Hopefully this next slide won't make any ID specialist shudder at its extreme overgeneralization. Staph infections, excluding MRSA, can typically be treated with the anti-staph penicillin nafzone. Strep infections can typically be treated with penicillin G or ceftriaxone. Enterococcus and listeria can typically be treated with ampicillin, remembering that Enterococcus fecium is often resistant to common antibiotics. And vancomycin is the best alternative for all of the above in patients with serious penicillin allergies. For the remainder of the lecture, I'm going to focus on the highly resistant gram-positive bacteria which essentially means just two organisms, MRSA and VRE. These are both resistant to typical conventional antibiotics and therefore represent a significant problem when patients are infected with them. Risk factors for developing these largely overlap. As you might expect, the most significant is recent antibiotic use with cephalosporins and quinolones conferring the greatest risk for MRSA and cephalosporins and vancomycin conferring the greatest risk for VRE. Other common risk factors are recent hospitalization, residents in a long-term care facility, and hemodialysis. Additional risk factors for MRSA only are injection drug use, HIV infection, and incarceration. So what antibiotics can be used for these highly resistant gram-positive infections? There are six. Vancomycin, daptomycin, elazolid, ceftaroline, the combination of quinupristin and dalfopristin, better known by its trade name Synersid, and tigacycline. Since these antibiotics are slightly less uh, familiar to you than penicillin, cephalosporins, and quinolones, let me review them in slightly more detail. In addition to mentioning their mechanism of action and their coverage, I'll also list their notable adverse reactions. These are not necessarily the most common adverse reactions per se, but are reactions that either have high associated morbidity or are somehow unique to a particular drug. Vancomycin, as you may recall from the last lecture, inhibits cell wall synthesis. It has excellent coverage of MRSA, but by definition, no coverage of VRE. Its notable adverse reactions include red man syndrome, sometimes known as red neck syndrome, which is a rash or flushing of the face, neck, and upper torso. It appears during infusion or within minutes of completion, is due to nonspecific mast cell degranulation and not a true allergy, and can be avoided by slowing the infusion rate down. Vancomycin can also cause nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, and neutropenia. Among the six drugs listed here, all of which are active against MRSA, the medical world has by far the greatest cumulative experience with vancomycin, um, and therefore it's considered to be the drug of choice when it's an option for MRSA. Aside from the side effects, other disadvantages to its use include poor penetration into the CSF, and drug levels often need to be monitored. Daptomycin damages the cell membrane, leading to fatal depolarization. It is active against MRSA and both VRE faecalis and fecium, though the latter a little less so. Its notable adverse reactions are myopathy, which requires weekly monitoring of CK levels, peripheral neuropathy, and very rarely an eosinophilic pneumonia. Linazolid prevents protein synthesis by inhibiting the 50S ribosomal subunit. It has great activity against MRSA 
and fair activity against the VRE. It has a number of relatively distinct side effects as far as antibiotics go, including myelosuppression, lactic acidosis, neuropathy, optic neuritis, and can trigger serotonin syndrome when combined with a number of other drugs. A major advantage of linazolid over the other five drugs listed is that it is the only one available PO. Ceftaroline is a so-called fifth generation cephalosporin, which as a beta-lactam inhibits cell wall synthesis also. It is the only beta-lactam which covers MRSA, but has no VRE coverage. It is the newest of the six to be approved in the US, and there really isn't a whole lot more to say about it. The drug more commonly known as Synersid is actually a 30 to 70 combination of quinupristin and dolphopristin, which are compounds in a class called streptogramins, which inhibit the 50S subunit. Although Synersid has some MRSA coverage, its real use is as one of the best antibiotics we have against VRE fecium. Interestingly, there is no coverage of VRE faecalis. As many as 50% of patients on Synersid will get myalgias and arthralgias. And because of a very high risk of thrombophlebitis, Synersid can only be given via a central line. Finally, tigacycline inhibits the 30S ribosomal subunit. It's active against all three bacteria. It can increase LFTs, causes photosensitivity, and may very rarely cause pancreatitis. In 2010, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration released a statement that tigacycline was associated with a very small but statistically significant increased risk of death compared to other similar antibiotics. This increased risk may be limited to those indications that are not FDA approved, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia, though the actual explanation of the increase is not definitively known. Appropriate use of one of these big six anti-gram-positive antibiotics are limited to a relatively small set of situations. First, and most obviously, treatment of infections known to be due to MRSA or VRE. Empiric treatment in combination with gram-negative coverage of septic shock of unknown etiology. Empiric treatment of most cases of neutropenic fever, lion sepsis, and septic arthritis. Routine surgical prophylaxis in patients with severe beta-lactam allergy. And finally, surgical prophylaxis prior to the implantation of prosthetics materials in hospitals with high rates of MRSA. For all of the above, with the exception of treating a known VRE infection, the first-line agent of choice is typically vancomycin. Finally, to close the lecture, I'd like to just briefly mention that there is occasionally need to try and treat either confirmed or suspected MRSA infections with an oral agent. In this situation, it's important to distinguish between community-acquired MRSA, or CA MRSA, versus hospital-acquired MRSA, as the latter is generally resistant to most oral agents aside from linazolid. Community-acquired MRSA, on the other hand, can occasionally be treated with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, clindamycin, doxycycline, linazolid, and rifampin, the last of which is not generally recommended for monotherapy. That concludes this lecture on antibiotics against gram-positive bacteria. The next lecture will go through an analogous discussion for antibiotics active against gram-negative bacteria.